Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. In a previous episode, I talked about the rock cycle, the generalized process by which rocks change from one into another type, and it covers a lot of territory, it covers a lot of different kinds of processes, like weathering, like metamorphic change, or like the melting or the freezing of molten rock. In this episode, I want to talk about igneous rock, the most possibly the most fundamental of the three major rock types, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. And that's because the crust of our world has always been essentially the result of partial melting of rock in the mantle, producing magma, and that which comes to the surface, like basaltic lava, when it reaches the surface, magma becomes lava, and it causes a new surface to grow of the early primordial earth, and built up an early crust similar to today's ocean crust. And then from that, from the ocean crust interacting with the mantle over time, you can refine continental rock, granitic rock. And I talked about that in a previous episode too. So what I want to talk about today is a general classification of how you deal with igneous rocks and how you name them. What what are they called and how are they different? Because you might say, okay, solidifying rock from magma, how different could it be? But it's as different as the Hawaiian black basaltic lava surface that you see if you go to the national park there. It's as different from that as it is from quartz granite. Granite is also an igneous rock and it forms under very different conditions and it's made of very different kinds of silicate minerals. And I want to talk about that. So I'm going to start with some geological vocabulary. If a magma body rises through the crust and then it freezes in place, that's what we call an intrusive igneous rock. An extrusive igneous rock is anything that's erupting on the surface. And yeah, that includes lava, but it also includes explosive volcanic material that you'd see, for example, during the eruption of Mount St. Helens or Pinatubo. These volcanoes don't erupt flowing magma, typically. They erupt rock that is undergoing explosive decompression because it's full of CO2 and water dissolved. And once it reaches near the surface, once it starts to erupt, it's going to just blow out just like a shaken carbonated beverage will blow out once you shake it up and you open the top because the CO2 suddenly comes out. Intrusive and extrusive igneous rocks. An intrusive magma body that freezes in place forms what we call a pluton. And we would call that a plutonic igneous rock. It is also intrusive. The terms mean subtly different things. Intrusive simply means that it is igneous rock that formed within the Earth. Plutonic specifically means it's part of a large pluton or magma chamber body that's rising from the mantle higher up into the crust before it freezes in place and forms a new part of the crust. Another important defining aspect of an igneous rock is its grain size, the size of the individual rock bits that make it up. If the grain size is very small, essentially the igneous rock is made up of tiny particles, then it's probably going to be something that erupted at the surface laying down layers of that stuff. If the crystals are very large, it means that the thing basically rose through the crust slowly, slowly enough that as the crystals begin to grow in the molten rock, into the molten magma, the crystals grow and keep growing and keep growing until all the magma is basically exhausted and you've got this mush of big crystals that solidify into place, and that's where we get things like big crystalline granite, uh, a northosite rock used to make countertops, big gorgeous felspar crystals. That's because it solidified slowly deep in the earth. Now on the converse, if it solidifies quickly, typically you have a very small grain size or no grains at all. If lava is very hot and molten, it erupts and freezes solid extremely quickly, then you can form obsidian a kind of igneous rock that's essentially glass. It's essentially lava glass, and that's why it fractures like glass, because it is glass. There's no grain size to it at all because it was just one molten mass that froze solid. If it had a little bit more time, it's going to grow a little bit larger crystals, and you're going to be able to take that rock, section it, and look at it under a microscope, and you'll see what we call a matrix or background material, the the fine-grained or even glassy material that the rock is mostly made of and in which are embedded all the different crystals that were growing from that melt as it was cooling as it ran across the earth's surface and froze. In that case the grain size will be intermediate because you'll you'll get some grains in there that are growing within the cooling magma and they have time to do that but then the whole thing stops so they never get very big. Obsidian has what we call glassy texture because like I said it is glass. There are all sorts of other ways you can describe the textures of igneous rocks 
because they can vary quite a bit. Another one is what we call vesicular. The vesicular texture of an igneous rock means that as it cooled and solidified, under whatever conditions it did, but we're usually talking about uh, eruptions of lava onto the surface. And so you can have a, ve a highly vesicular rock like pumice, which is essentially full of void spaces and, and cavities, which is why it's so light, because it was full of dissolved water vapor, CO2, etc., and that was all bubbling out like crazy as that piece of igneous rock solidified at Earth's surface. Another kind of texture is porphyritic. The rock texture has a fine-grained aspect to it. There's a, most of it is really fine-grained, and, and maybe some small crystals in there, but then you've got these really big crystals that are embedded in this. How do you get that? Well, well, typically what happens is if you have magma that's moving up through the crust, it may move fairly slowly, so some minerals might start to crystallize out. A few early types of minerals might begin to crystallize and grow their grain size in that magma, and then it erupts. Then suddenly you erupt that material onto the surface, and it freezes solid, and the background material doesn't have much time to grow larger crystals into it, so it just freezes in place as it is. It's grown crystals as it's ascended through the crust, and then it erupts suddenly, freezing, and leaving this really bimodal distribution of grain size. Finally, in terms of textures, you can describe a rock that has what we call a pyroclastic texture. What's happening is during a very violent eruption, as you've got magma rushing to the surface, exolving gases such as a Mount St. Helens type eruption, and ex essentially exploding up into the atmosphere. As that happens, you're going to have massive amounts of material that's already on the slopes of that volcano that is going to essentially be loose rubble that's going to flow down the mountainside with every new blast of eruption material that falls onto it. And so you can get whole layers of igneous rock, which is essentially fallen from the sky, compacted down, and solidified and hardened over time, if you dig it up later after it's been buried for a long time. And the texture will be very distinct. You won't have a rock made of little tiny crystals that grew in liquid. You won't have a rock that's made up of lots of little bits of sand and pebbles and whatnot. You have a rock made of shards. You have a rock made of tiny, broken, angular, shards of shattered rock and rock that essentially froze solid as it flew through the air. Pyroclastic texture is a dead giveaway that you're looking at rock that was laid down during a violent, explosive volcanic eruption, produced enough material to compact down into layers to make up that rock.